not for my God, not for what he's done for me, not for everything that he took me through and he didn't leave me behind even though I deserve it and not everything he's taken me to and it's so big I can't ever see it. You know what? I'm walking towards it, but I'm not going to get to it without a personal praise for what he's done. Let me ask you here at Acceleration Church, do you believe that there is a God in Oh, that's what, that's what I knew. That's what I knew. I knew y'all were worshiping church. You know why I know that? Because the way your pastors talk about you. You know how you know when a guy really likes a girl? When you bring up her name, and he's trying to be all cool. He's like, yeah, like I'm hard, I'm bad. And you mention her name, and he goes, like his eyes, his little face giving away, and he's like, no, I'm hard. I'm cool, I get it. Yes, my woman. I'm like, sure, that, that's, that's your power. <laughs> that's what I see come over your pastor's faces when they talk about you. They might be in the middle of a business conversation, a church conversation. They might be talking to other church leaders, and they mention Acceleration Church, and their face goes, They are so proud of you, so proud of who you are, so proud of where you come from, and they are so excited about their foot on the gas and the light that is shining and where you are going. Because, folks, we are not at a destination. We are on a journey, and we are going somewhere good. Can I get a good amen? Amen and amen. Come on. Was this band amazing today? Come on, y'all. That was fire. That was fire. And those vocals, I didn't know Tasha Cobb worshipped here. I didn't know Tasha Cobb was here. I, I, I didn't know Tasha was here. Good mercy. And then this guy breaks out on the guitar and this whole thing. And I was just like, well. I mean, I knew, I knew, I knew the, the electricity awards were amazing. It's not the Electricity Awards. But we're shining a light, Pastor. These are the Electricity Awards, right? Electricity? How do you say it? What? Okay. Okay, so at the All City Awards. They're not the All City Awards. What are they again? Alacrity. That's right. So, so Benita was so kind. She picked me up. I just flew in from. Where did I fly in from? Where was I? I was in Chicago. I was in East Chicago yesterday and flew in from East Chicago. And Benita was so sweet to pick me up at the airport last night. And she was trying to coach me on how to say that word. Y'all are too sophisticated for me. I've lived a third of my life on a gravel road. I can say things like dirt, rocks. You know, y'all, I'm not caught up to to come and die poor is education. P.S. You need an education just to say their names. Because I wanted to say, day oh Right? But it's not. It's Dio. So I can't even sing the song. Okay. So she's coached me how to say that. And it reminded me of, have you ever heard of Dr. Uh, Bishop, uh, Bishop Dale Bronner? Dr. Bishop. He's got all the titles. So we were at his church in Atlanta with this little-known guy who'd written this movie, with had, had this name, and actually Bishop Dale Bronner was the one who chose the name for this movie, and they had to coach me on the name of this movie, too. It's called Acrimony. I'm like, I don't know what acrimony means. And he, he's like, well, there's this little struggling director. I brought a picture of the director because you probably never heard of him. Did you? Uh, this guy. So it's a little guy, you probably never heard of him. His name's Tyler Perry. He calls Bishop Bronner and says, hey, I need a word for this woman. She's been jilted. Da, da. And Dr. Bishop Dale Bronner is very much like Dale. Dale. And to Koapuri, they're very educated, very sophisticated. And so the word for that movie came from the church. And so they had to coach us on acrimony. By the way, you know, Tyler Perry is such a big deal. And so when we got invited to eat dinner with him and, and Dr. Bronner after church that night, 
we never ask for a picture. We never ask for anything to be done because, I mean, after all, it's, I'm sure that's what everybody does to him, right? So we just wanted to respect him, respect his time. So we get up after dinner, and he goes, so y'all want to take a selfie? <laughs> uh, wait, let me check my calendar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And he's like, he's like, okay, so we're trying to like to get ready. And he's like, you know, I have long arms. Would you like me to take this up? You see how his shoulder's up? Because Tyler Perry offered to take a selfie with us. And I thought, no wonder the Lord has raised him up. Humble thyself under the mighty hand of God. And in due time, so his due time included some homeless time. His due time included some live in your car time. His due time included some nobody believed in him time. At one point in time, he was broken, but he was building. That's the title of my message today. The title of my message today is Broken but building. You know, getting to hear your pastor's testimony of where Pastor Tokoa came from, she didn't come from a silver spoon life. You know, when I met her, I thought, mm, silver spoon. Her mom is a doctor. Her daddy's an attorney. At dinner, they sit with the Huxtables. And they just, you know, eat their little fin with their little cute spins. And this poor girl from the country don't know nothing about a girl like her. Except we got to talking and realized neither one of us were born with a silver spoon. Y'all eat, ever eaten at KFC? Can anybody praise God for the chicken nuggets at the KFC right now? Little popcorn things, they come in the big, not the small one, the big one. Can anybody just give God a good amen right now? Oh, I didn't know I was at a Popeye's crowd. All right, I see you, I see you. I've never been able to eat one of the sandwiches. The lines were too long, they ran out. So I was talking and we, were, we realized we weren't Silver Spoon kind of girls. We were KFC Spork and a couple of our tongs were broken. And Pastor Dio, they are a perfect picture of your past does not indicate your future. For my note takers in the room, you are not defined by your past. You are prepared by your past for the future that God has for you. You can't look backwards to decide what's in front of you. You can look backwards as a reference, but you have to look forward because that's where you're going. If you try and drive backwards, you're going to get in a wreck and an accident. And if you feel like it's stuck, maybe it's because you're trying to drive with your eyes in the rearview mirror. Now we're going to get our eyes on the future that God has for you. God has for your family. God has for Acceleration Church. And we're going to go forward full steam ahead. Can I get a good amen in this house? Woo! Broken, but building. So uh, a little bit of my story. Um, I, I did bring a book. I'm going to mention it this one time. That's going to go away. I brought a book. It's called I Will Survive. And the word survive is ripped off the page. And then it's replaced with the word thrive. Because God told me in my heart, he said, I'm sick of my people praying for survival. Praying for if I can just get through this. He says, nowhere in my word did I say I'm a just get through this kind of God. No, he said, in my word, I promise that I'm exceedingly, abundantly, over, above, all you can ask, think, or imagine. And for my, my children to set their expectation on the bottom of the barrel, they're setting their expectation below where I ever dreamed of them being. He said that my children are top of the barrel, cream of the crop, over and above, going to live beyond. And I'm telling you right now, my friends, we can't survive. You're not, if you walk through cancer, you're not a cancer survivor. Mm -mm -mm -mm. That's what I just get by. If you, you were an alcoholic and God delivered you, you didn't survive alcoholism. If you were married to someone who was abusive, you are not a domestic violence survivor. You are a child of the Most High King. And regardless of what has happened to you or because of you, the call on your life never changed because Jesus Christ knew who you were before you were ever born into this planet. P.S. You were not born to a woman. You were born through a woman because God needed her as a channel to get you on the earth for 
for such a time as this because you are purposed and you are destined. And if you are living below your call because you're surviving, it's time we shift your mentality today because you are a light shining on a hill. You are a city on a hill. You are salt and light, and your call has not diminished. Can somebody in this house praise him today? Broken, but building. Broken, but building. So I came up a gravel road, so my mention of the book was, here's my story in 90 seconds. Don't let it get too deep too quick because people have a tendency to get quiet. I just want to let you know the end of the story is good. Because the story starts out, I was born in Canada, given up by my dad before I was born, and adopted in the U.S. by my stepdad, adopted dad. His name's Robert. I call him dad. I was adopted by him when I was three years old. My parents got married uh, the day before my third birthday, and I was in the wedding, and I didn't know all kids were not in their weddings. I didn't know I was adopted till I was 10. When I was 10, I found out I was adopted. I got saved. Thank you, Jesus. And I was molested for the first time. And that's where people start to go, I don't know how Gary likes Gary likes that information. We can react to that information fine because Jesus Christ has healed my heart. He healed my soul. He healed my spirit. He healed my body. And I might have some scars. This might not be attractive, but I have this little new scar on my knee right here. You see that little nasty little thing right there? That is a brand new scar because we, are, we just bought our eighth church. in our third state of Illinois and as I was climbing to the, onto the roof of this 10 plex movie theater that is now going to preach the gospel I was climbing up the ladder to the roof and and I, I caught a little edge on the ladder and I, I cut myself and for the first few days well while I was there the, the the blood started pouring out down my leg and people could see it and people knew I was hurting but then it started healing up, and the scab's almost gone, and now there's a little scar, and you can poke it, prod it. It doesn't hurt a bit. You know, most people will show you their stars, but they won't show you their scars. And I know you've been wounded, but Jesus came so that he could heal us. And our scars don't hurt anymore. And I want to give you permission to show people where you've been broken. And talk about how good Jesus was to you. And so my testimony is I tell people about my, my scars. And I didn't want to because in, in fifth grade I told a little girl what happened to me. She was one of my best friends. And I was 10, so I didn't, like, think this ball away down the field. What does a little girl do when she hears a secret? Oh, oh, and she did. So we were poor anyway, eating out of our garden. Our brand new car was a car that was bought out of a junkyard. My mom was a housewife. She had three kids at home. My dad was a factory worker who'd been laid off. And so this was just, I wrote a whole chapter in my book called The Bully Bus. Because getting on the bus was such a tension point because this bus driver would be yelling to me, sit down, or we're not moving this bus. And the kids would be saying, not in my seat. So do I fight with the bus driver or do I fight with the kids? There was more of them than there was of me. There was only one bus driver. I think I could take him. So I know what it's like to feel like you're between a rock and a hard place. Do you hear what I'm talking about? I'm talking about broken but building. I was raped when I was 13 years old by somebody doing community service in my school, and then we moved. And where no had failed me in rape and molestation, yes seemed to be a really good word in high school. I didn't know that somebody would want to invite me to a party because I was used to not being invited to the parties. When they went and said, Nicole, you want to come to a party? My answer was, hey, we're going to do some drinking at the party. Is that okay? And we're going to be smoking a little stuff. Is that all right with you? Y'all smart. Where were you when I was in high school? Needed that crew around me because the crew around me kept having me say yes. There's going to be boys. Is that okay? Yes. They're going to kiss you. Is that okay? Yes. And your girl ended up a pregnant, unwed mother at 17 years old. I, that is the resume of your pastor for the day. <laughs> Don't worry, Pastor Dale. Dale. And Tacoa are going to be back next week, so don't worry about it. My future got worse before it got better because I waited five years to marry somebody. 
And when I married somebody, he had the right medical initials after his name. He had high cheekbones, and he had six-pack abs. Somebody pray to Jesus for six-pack abs. Jesus. He had to be right. He had a job and app. And um, it was three weeks into our marriage that he used crack cocaine for the first time. Everything changed. He broke my rib. He herniated my C7. He ended up stalking me. Guns were involved. Police were involved. 25 years suspended in position of sentence for him. Um, I went into hiding. Had to quit my job as a marketing director at a Fortune 500 company because he was trying to hurt me. And then God. I just start all that. I, I talk about all that in the book and the coping mechanisms, but I tell you all that to let you know I know about broken, but building. Let me share a scripture with you. It's in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10. It says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me. Who did God give his grace to? Me. Everybody say me. So uh, according to the grace of God. What is grace? Grace is God's unmerited favor. It's something you can't earn. It's something you can't buy. It's something you don't deserve. It's like walking in today and one of those envelopes had a million dollar check in it. I prophesy that in the name of Jesus. Million dollar checks, Lord. But it's like a million dollar check. So if if somebody handed you a million dollar check and said, there's no strings attached, the Lord just told me to give this to you, be blessed, would you receive it? Grace is the same thing. Right? So they, it says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder. What kind of grace did God give you? God gave you grace to be a wise master builder. He says, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. So we have three churches in St. Louis. Three churches? We have Ferguson, Florissant. No, we have four. Okay. You lose track of them sometimes. We have Ferguson, Florissant, Weldon Spring, Earth City, Sunset Hills. Pastor Taco has been to St. Louis. Pastor Dio, have you been to St. Louis or just Florida? So, okay, so they've been to St. Louis. So they know a couple of our churches, 2,400-seat auditoriums. They're, they're big. And so it, we spend one week there. Then the next week we're in, in West Palm Beach, Florida. We have two campuses. We have a chapel campus. We're in a portable school. And so when I'm in Florida, I like to walk on the beach, and I, I'm, a, I'm a total nerd. Uh, yo soy la nerda. Yeah. Mi amigos de, de Latino. Aquí, sí, no, no, sí. <laughs> Uh, yo soy un poquito español. ¿Tú hablas? ¿No? ¿Sí? <laughs> My Spanish people in the house usually holla. <laughs> so, but, um, yeah, and just for the re record, I am totally a gringa. I'm just a nerd, and I'm studying Spanish because I love that language. But as in a third of our, our, our congregation in Florida is Latino. A third, we're a third Latino, we're a third Islander, and we're a third people who need a tan. But as I'm walking on the beach in Florida, uh, I was reading a book about a guy who loved to go exploring on, on beaches, and he'd look for caves, and he'd look for hidden treasure. And so he's really um, never found anything, and he walked into a cave one day, and he found this, like, kind of burlap sack, and it had, like, 50 or 60 clay balls in it. And that was, like, the biggest thing he'd ever found. So he's, like, kind of excited about it. So he's like, okay, these are really cool. And as he's walking down the beach, he's trying to figure out how can I glorify God with this? I mean, this is my big treasure. Do I take it home and put it on my shelf? What do I do? And so he's playing with them, and he's like, I know what I'll do. I will just glorify God with the strength that he gave me. And he starts walking down the beach, and he starts throwing them into the ocean as far as he can, as far as he can. And he's like, God, look how strong you made me. He's like, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to glorify you with the dexterity that you gave me. So he had a dream of finding a treasure, all he found was clay balls, but he found a way to glorify God with what he, he had even found. So he starts skipping it on the water. Oh, that one was two. Try another one. Oh, three skips on that one. God, look at how dexterous, dexterous, dexterous. I need the sophisticated people for these words. So he just starts skipping the rocks, and he's glorifying God, and he just keeps walking down the beach. You know, I wonder sometimes with our life, we expect more out of our life than we have. But what we look at is when we find things in our life, we find, God, I wish you would have given me something cool. I wish I could be funny like Jarvis. 
I mean, I wish that, that, that like, the, the National Criminal Justice Institute would ask me to go talk to them, and I wish I would have this fantastic, fluffy education, and, you know, I wish I could cook like, Jarvis, did you make the food, too? I wish I could cook like Jarvis. You are a multi-talented man. Oh, 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 we forgot to give one award today. Best MC award goes to Jarvis. So we, we look around and we see other people's gifts and we're like, God, why did you, why, why can she, why can, why can they sing like Tasha? And why can they play like they should be on the, the Grammys? And, and, and here's just me. And all I can do is, all I have in my life is, hmm. Let's go back to that scripture we were in. That scripture we were in is 1 Corinthians 3. Let's go to verse 11. It says, For no other foundation can anyone lay that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Let's talk about that foundation for a minute. So our very first church, when we started, I married a guy who was a worship leader. He can sing, and he's cute. So I had divorced my first husband. And he's trying to track me down. And yet there was this, this worship leader who was willing to invest in a girl who was very, very broken. And God was working on healing me. And we were, I was never going to pastor. My father-in-law was 56 years old. Six years into my marriage, my father-in-law turned 60. No, wait. Six years into my mar marriage, my father-in-law turned 56. He said he was going to preach to us till he was 90. And we believed him. And then he went to heaven unexpectedly. So my husband and I didn't know what to do except for try and be there for the people. We had a church of about 180 people, and we didn't know what to do. We just said, well, let's be there for them. Let's, let's just try. And we did. And we had lived 35 highway miles away from the church. So there was this little tiny house next to the church. The church owned it and we used it for storage. We cleaned it out. It stunk. We couldn't afford a new carpet. We just painted the walls the best we could. Where was Byron in those days? I could have used Byron in my life. You know what I'm saying? Uh, bought a bed from a yard sale, put it in there, and started spending the night there. Our daughter was three months old. A few months into that, my daughter went on breathing treatments, and we couldn't figure out what was wrong with her and her lungs. She just couldn't seem to get healed. And in Florida, I've learned, you don't have basements. But you all know what a basement is, right? You watch the horror movies, and when the guy with the chainsaw is chasing them, they go down into the basement instead of out of the house. Like, okay, let's make the worst possible decision. So in St. Louis, we have basements. So at one point in time, we finally went down to the basement of that little house, and we realized that there was a big crack coming all the way down one of the concrete walls, and water was coming in. There was water all on the floor in this basement. The house was full of mold, and that's why my daughter was having all the breathing trouble. It had a cracked foundation. So I do a lot of the construction work for our church. And by that, I don't mean I do the physical work anymore. So I was in the corporate world, and some months I was doing really, really good when I met David Crank. I was making, a, well, let's just say a whole lot of money. And God told me to quit my job and volunteer for the ministry full time because they couldn't afford to pay me. And I said, get thee behind me, Satan. And I knew my husband was not going to go for this. So I told David, finally, after about like a month or so struggling with, like, y'all, I, I, I had a couple times, like right even in that time period, my monthly paycheck was six figures. So, like, how do you quit that? And so I told my husband, I said, this is all I could get out. <laughs> And then I finally said, I think God wants me to quit my job. And he made like $350 every two weeks. And he said, um, I think God wants you to quit your job. You know, sometimes God front loads your blessing to see if you're searching him for his hand or his heart. And if you're searching him for his hand, you're broken. You're not building. So I quit my job and I volunteered full time for the church for four years. And while we did that, we flipped houses. So I would, we would go into a house, we would fix it up so your girl can wire a plug. Does anybody even know what that means? I could show you how to wire a plug. I also can tile a kitchen floor. 
Do you know why I learned to tile a kitchen floor? Because we learned that my husband cannot tile a kitchen floor. Right? Sometimes you do what you need to do. And so I would show up on the church construction sites because we bought several buildings over 100,000 square feet. And I was in charge of working with the construction crews to get the remodeling projects done. And I would show up in shoes like these and they would look at me and go, hmm. I can hear you. Sometimes when you meet people, they will try and break down your confidence. But you can be broken, but building. You see, here's the word that Jesus is working on in me. When I read my Bible, I keep seeing the word let. Let not your heart be troubled. Which means the trouble may come. But if it troubles me, it's not his fault. It's not their fault. Guess whose fault it is? Because the Bible says, let not. I have to allow things to break me. But with God, he can give us the power to walk through things without allowing it to break us. And trouble's going to come. So, so I would go on those construction sites and I would start building things. And they would look at me like I, I was weird and I was funny because I was dressed wrong in their opinion. But it wasn't my first time, y'all. I know how to float concrete. I didn't even know that concrete floated when I started. It doesn't. When you put it down, you get a big stick, and it's got a big flat thing on it, and you got to run it over the top, and you got to do it as soon as they pour that concrete. And it is hard work, and it wears you out. But I've done 6,000 square feet of concrete floating. I know. I got a PhD. Did y'all know that? I do. It's for post hole digging. Not that, not, not, not y'all's kind of education. But the trial, trials will come. So 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 13. No other foundation can anyone lay that which was laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation, and be careful if your foundation is cracked like the one that we had. Because if you build on a cracked foundation, we went back to that house, we sold that building to an, that whole property, that, that campus to another church, and they ended up tearing that house down. You know why they tore the house down? Because it was on a crack foundation. You have to either repair the crack, heal the crack, or get rid of the crack. And I have plumber jokes in my head right now. Don't bend over and let anybody see your crack. Do not expose your crack. It's our job to get our crack healed. Turn to your neighbor right now and tell him, get your crack healed. <laughs> Is this okay? Because it's a little too much. I don't know. I'll dial it down. I'll dial it down. Okay, I just feel it at home right now. It's at home. It's at home. Verse 12. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, how many of us like gold? Say amen. Silver. Amen. Precious stones. Bring it, Jesus. Wood. Hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work, what sort it is. Y'all, we want the destiny, but we don't want the drama. And destiny does not come without drama. And ch chapter 15 of my book is written, the chance doesn't come without the challenge. The reason that I know that there is drama and challenge involved in the chance and the destiny is because the Bible says to walk by faith and not by sight. And why do you have to walk by faith? Because you see circumstances that are contrary. And if you walk by circumstances, you will stop. But if you go ahead and walk by faith, I write in my book, faith does not even begin until our ability ends. So the only time we get in trouble with that is when you coordinate that with Hebrews 11, 6 that says without faith it's impossible to please God. So if that means true faith is doing something that is 100% impossible in our own strength, how many of us are truly walking by faith? How many of you know stepping off right here would be a bad idea? Say amen. There should be at least one area of our life that we're taking a step that looks like this. And if we are not stretching this big, come on, somebody. If we are not stretching this hard, we're not truly walking by faith. And that means that without faith, it's impossible to please God. 
So that means we're not pleasing God. So God's not looking at your brokenness. He's asking you to walk by faith. And when the fire comes, everybody say, when the fire comes. So I heard this story when I was a kid. It's about these three little pigs, which I thought were the three kids in our family because, y'all, we ate a lot. And it said, so there's these three little pigs, and they, they build these three little houses, and one of them made a house out of straw. I wonder how many of us build our house once we get to Jesus, and we're like, i got a nice foundation now. You know, he's healed me, so I'm going to go ahead and start building. The problem is a lot of times we start building things in our own strength and get this outside of our call. Do you all know the story of this guy named Naaman? Naaman, Naaman, it depends on how you want to say his name. Dale! So Naaman, Naaman, he is the one who gets told to go dip in the Jordan seven times to get clean of leprosy. He didn't want to do it because he's like a big-time general. He's like a Tyler Perry in the military, so he don't want to do that. Like, can't this guy just pray for me and heal me? What's his problem? Doesn't he know who I am? That's a house of straw. When we start building things in our own strength, it's a house of straw. When we start doing what we want to do and not what God wants us to do, it's a house of straw. So, so he, gets, he gets healed, and he goes back in, and he tells Elisha, thank you, what can I, what can I give you for this healing? And, and Elisha says nothing. But he's got this assistant, Gehazi. Listen to this. Elisha did several miracles. Elisha got the double anointing. He did 14 miracles. It only stands to reason that Gehazi would have probably been the Jesus portion, which would have been unlimited miracles. He was in line to be a miracle worker. He was the assistant to Elisha the way Elisha was the assistant to Elijah. Don't be jealous of your covering. So he was jealous of Elisha. And how did he turn that down? And I can finally get me an Armani suit. He offered us clothes and jewels, and he went out and got it. He put on those clothes, and he got leprosy. God told me the leprosy was in the clothes. That's why I had Elisha turn it down. Gehazi built a house of straw. And when the fire came, it burnt it down. So the second little piggy, he comes along. He's like, well, I learned about that house of straw. I'm going to build me a house of wood. I mean, this is going to be strong. People build houses of wood all the time. That's when we see other people building things. We're like, why can't I do that? I mean, they're doing that, and it's working out strong for them. It should be strong for me. So we go ahead and we try and build our house out of wood because we think it worked for somebody else. Let me ask you a question. I want you to write this down. Even if you're not a note taker, get out your phone. I want you to write down this question. What is God calling you to do? that you aren't doing. Now, if we're real, there's at least one answer. And one of them has to do with talking to somebody, forgiving somebody, calling somebody, apologizing to somebody, which nobody ever wants to write on their list because, like, I don't want to do that because I wasn't really at fault. It was totally their fault because you don't know what happened. And if you heard my, God's like, I don't care. I just know that strife hampers your life. And it's a broken foundation. And where strife is, there's confusion and every evil work. Here's the crazy thing. Sometimes our foundation is fine until we crack it. This part's quiet, sorry. We got to do a little work right here. What is God calling you to do that you're not doing? Because you're called to walk by faith. You're called to step out on what you can't step out on. But we can't go ahead and do what we want to do because we want to do it. Because if we want to do it, when the fire comes, and it will, our work will not survive. If our work so far has not survived, it was made out of wood. Unless the Lord builds a house, Psalm 127, they labor in vain. If God called you to be Gehazi, be the best Gehazi you can be. Because Gehazi will get at least Elisha's reward. Because he's serving in the same place. When your church does something good in the city, when your pastors get $25,000 allocated from Walmart for the Pace Kids, guess what reward you're getting? 
You serve this house. You serve with these pastors. You get the exact same reward in heaven. Y'all send them to go. Go do the work. I'm getting the reward. I'm sitting over here rewarded over here. We can't build what we want to build. We can't build how we want to build it. There's this third little piggy. And the third little piggy said, well, I saw y'all, and I saw what you did. And it's going to take me more time, and it's going to look like I'm going slower. Write this down. It looks like you're going slower, but you're really going faster. Because what you're building is going to last. You know, I could throw together 12 hay bales right now, and it would look like a good wall. But how many of you know, you put a fire to that, and it ain't going to last a minute. It's going to take me longer and more sweat to build that same wall out of these stones. But you bring a fire up here, these stones aren't going anywhere. They're going to stand, having done all to stand, stand therefore. You know, I don't think it's any accident that it says that Jesus Christ is our chief cornerstone. So it says that Jesus Christ is our chief cornerstone, and it says no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You know, a lot of us want to build, but we get stuck in, I want to build, but no, I don't know that I can because of what happened to me in my childhood. I don't know if I can build because I'm walking through a divorce. I don't know if I can build because, you know, you don't know what he's doing to me. He's cheating on me. Y'all, I've been all those places. I can't trust again because you can tell God every reason why you can't, why you're broken. But let me submit to you a scripture about brokenness in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. Actually, do y'all have these? That scripture says, for we have this light shining in our hearts. You know, I, I love that y'all were be the light, let the light shine. Because if this light right now, if you turn the lights out, you can't see this right now. Right now it does no good. You can't do anything with this until it's broken. And once you break it, the light starts being released. You know, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And that scripture goes on to say, so we have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like these fragile jars of clay. Oh, I left that guy on the beach. He was throwing stuff into the water. So he was throwing this stuff into the water, and, and he was skipping the rocks. And then he dropped one, and it fell on a rock on the ground. And when it fell on the rock on the ground, it cracked. And when it cracked, he could see something inside it just a little bit. So he started trying to crack it some more and started trying to crack it some more. And when he did, he opened it up, and there were, there were jewels inside of it. And there were diamonds inside of it and there were rubies inside of it and there was gold inside of it and he opened it up and he's like I had no idea what looked like this clay that wasn't worth anything and all this jewels all this value was on the inside but we have this light shining in our hearts but we ourselves are like these fragile jars of clay and we are containing this great treasure you know, here's the thing about brokenness is this clay, if it's whole, you can't see through it. But if it becomes broken and then you put a light behind it, now you can see through it. You see the light through the broken places. God didn't do it to you but he will flow through that if you let him. So we have this light shining in our hearts and we ourselves are like these fragile jars of clay containing this great treasure. And this makes it clear 
The great power is not from ourselves. It's from God. I came today to celebrate your leadership, to celebrate the hours you've put in, to celebrate how you're serving God. And I've came to encourage you. Don't use your past as an excuse. God told me you're going to make your pain your platform, which is exactly what I told him I would not do because of what had happened to me when I was 10 years old. And I told that little girl and she told everybody else. I didn't tell anybody I was raped when I was 13 years old. And God told me when I was in Florida, hiding from my husband, working in a diner for cash, living in a hotel for cash, which was a point five-star hotel. Y'all, the point is a roach. And they are your roommate. I'm, I'm here to tell you. While I was hiding, quit my marketing director at a Fortune 500 job to hide. But I was surviving. I'm a survivor. No, no, Beyonce. I love Beyonce. She got that one wrong. I'm not a survivor. I'm a thriver. I might have been broken, but I'm building. And I could have lived on that level and stayed at that diner job and lived in that little nasty hotel, but God had bigger plans for a broken girl, and God has bigger plans for you. He sees the light shining on the inside of you. He sees the value in you that he planted in you from the beginning of time, and just because other people can't see it, it's because the light ain't shining bright enough yet. So you got to go ahead and say, I know what it looks like on the outside, but I'm going to go Go ahead and shine this light from the inside because it wasn't me in the first place. It was God that was on the inside of me. And unless we stand up and let this light shine, we are going to let our opportunity pass. And Esther Morin says, you were called for such a time as this. So don't wait for tomorrow or God will raise somebody else up. But he wants to raise you up, Acceleration Church. He wants to know, do you see it in you? And as I close, I want to let you know there was a meeting in heaven that happened about you before you were born. I happened to have the transcripts to that meeting. It went like this. God came to Jesus and he said, Jesus... Wow, I'm thinking about creating Tekoa. I'm going to use Pastor Tekoa for this one. And just put your name in there. And Jesus goes, okay. And God says, she's going to be a hot mess. Hot mess express. She's going to act up, be sassy, pray prayers. God, she might cuss you a couple. God's like, she's going to cuss us a couple times. I mean, it's going to be bad. Jesus goes, okay. God says, Jesus, in order for me to create Tekoa, you're going to have to die for all that nastiness. Jesus stops and he pauses. He goes, okay. God says, Jesus, if you'll die for her, I'll go ahead and write her name down. And we'll plan on her life, we'll plan out her life and her eternity. That same meeting in heaven happened about you. That's why I told you you weren't born to a woman. You were born through a woman. It doesn't matter who your parents are or what your parents did or if they wanted you or not. He didn't need them. He needed a way to get you here. He knew about you. You were not a surprise. You don't serve an accidental God. You serve an intentional God. He has never made a mistake, and he's not going to start with you. You are now in this time on purpose because you have a light, a voice, an influence, a power, a gift, a talent, and a space that is needed now. So I want to reference that first question. What is God calling you to do that you're not doing yet? And if you know the answer, if you know that question is for me and I have an answer for that question I want you to stand up in your space right now at your chair so I can pray for you who in this room knows God called me to something I'm not doing yet would you stand with me so I can pray for you You know what I'm 
loving. I'm watching sila happen as people are pondering and then standing. You know what? God loves that consideration that you're actually thinking about his word. You know, me and God, we're friends now because we've been through everything together. <laughs> and I keep trying to run away from him, but he won't let me. And God ever tracked you down? Here's what I know about him. He's never lost a battle. He's never given up on you. You might have given up on him. You might have given up. And he is in heaven being your biggest cheerleader. Saying, come on. I really need you to believe me. I really need you to trust me. Like, I wrote your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. I gave you a destiny. Would you please fulfill it? He's a gentleman. He's not going to force his will on you. But he's going to ask you to step up and step in. And I know you have been leading. And I know you have been doing a good job. But of the people who are standing today, I want to ask you a question. If God asks you to take one more step into the deep end of the pool and trust him and walk by faith and step into this thing, I want you to raise your hand high. If you're like, Lord, that's me. Pick me. I'm in. I'm going to do it. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to be with you. Father God, here we are. We're raising our hand by faith. We have no way to do it, and we don't know how to accomplish it, but God. Those are the only two words that we need is but God. So Holy Spirit, I ask you to come into this room. Speak wisdom. Speak direction. Drop ideas. God, we trust you to close all the wrong doors. And we won't try and beat them down. God, I ask you to open all the right doors. And we won't hesitate and stand back and not walk through because we don't think we're good enough. That couldn't possibly be for us. No, God, give them courage. Encourage them to step out and step big, to proclaim your name and to shine. Pause them for just a moment because the Holy Spirit's speaking to me. Give me one second. Direction change direction change there are man's plans and there are God's ways and the Holy Spirit is talking to somebody right now through me and he said there is a direction change you thought it was east and it was west you thought it was forward but it's back you thought it was right but it was left and you're not gonna want to make this direction change the Holy Spirit says but if you will do what does not come natural to your mind if you trust me in this thing he said, you're going to have to walk it out several steps, but as you get there, you will look back and say, God, thank you for making me make this direction change. God says that way you're wanting to go, it's never going to work. It's never going to work. It's never going to work. I'm not telling you no so you have less. I'm telling you no so you have more. I'm not telling you no because it's no. I'm telling you no because it's a better yes. Give us courage, Lord, to follow your direction, your correction. And we make the election to stand in your perfection. Not the good, not the acceptable, but the perfect will of God. In Jesus' name, I pray. And everybody who loves Jesus said, amen and amen. Can you give God just some glory for a minute? Just give him some glory. Thank you, Jesus. We just worship you, Lord. We honor your name, and we are thankful for it. You know, I was raised in the country, and I told you I ate out of a garden. And the garden that I ate out of, um, we had these little seeds. And these little packets came, and the little packets were about 20 cents. And with these little 20-cent packets, there were all these little things in here that didn't look like they made a big difference. 
but each of those little seeds made a difference on whether or not we would eat. Now, when we would take those little seeds out to the garden, I'd, we'd, have to, we'd have to till the garden. We'd have to go ahead and make a row. My dad would get this thing out called a tiller, and it was a little bit of work. You see, if you're planting a seed and it doesn't take any work, you need to look at the soil you're planting it in. So then we would go ahead and put the seeds in, and we would cover the seeds up. You know, some of y'all are like, it's, I'm, in a, I'm in a dark place, and it is tight, and I feel like I am stuck. Be careful before you try and get out of that place because you may be a seed and God may be trying to get you to germinate. Because you've got to put in roots before you can grow. So we would plant the seeds and we'd put the dirt on top and then we had to wait. The Bible says there's, everybody says it, seed time and harvest. There's seed time and harvest. Whoa, now slow down, slow down with your bad self. There's seed, which cost us something. There's time which we are not patient in. And then there is harvest. So the seeds, I couldn't go out and check on the seed and see if it was coming up. I couldn't go out and check on the seed and see what was going on or I would ruin the seed. I had to plant it, leave it in the dark place and trust God. And then it would start to grow. And when it would start to grow, the thing is, when the little bitty tomatoes were come, we could eat the little bitty tomatoes, but how many of you know that would feed us a lot less than the big tomato? Be careful before you pick your harvest. You don't want to grab it all too soon. So then we would go out to the garden. And here's the thing about seed time and harvest. Harvest is work too. You can't just go to bed and pray, Jesus, bring it. I'm going to go to bed. I hope it's here when I wake up. Harvest is work. You have to pray over it. You have to call it in. You got to go to work. You got to go where he leads. You got to do what he says. I had to go out to the garden. So my mom said, "Would you before you go play, she would hand me a five-gallon buck, bucket, and she would tell me, fill it up with cucumbers, fill it up with green beans, fill it up with tomatoes, fill it up with lima beans. Y'all, I hate filling up with lima beans because that takes a really long time. So I had to go pick, 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 pick it. And I had to work to bring in the harvest. But the process fed my family. But the process How many of you know we did not eat a five-gallon bucket of green beans for dinner? We can't eat that many green beans because we serve an exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask, think, or imagine God. So we would eat some of the green beans. Then my mama did some canning. So we would go ahead and we would prepare them and we would can them and we would put them in a jar because when God gives you the harvest, he doesn't send you just enough harvest for today. He sends you enough harvest for today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. And here's the cool thing about the garden. I didn't go out to the garden one time with my five-gallon bucket. I went out to the garden every day with my five-gallon bucket. And today, I harvested tomatoes, and we canned them, and we made spaghetti sauce. And the next day, I canned lima beans. They were my least favorite, but they still fed the family. The next day, we went in, and we got green beans, and we canned green beans for you. Next day, I got cucumbers, and we made bread and butter pickles. Jesus, I love a bread and butter pickle. We made dill pickles. We made canned and cucumbers. We made all the things. The next day I went out and got potatoes. And the next day I went out and got strawberries. And the next day I went out and got grapes. And God just kept bringing in the harvest every day and every day and every day and every day until our harvest overtook our soul. But there's a cycle that starts the whole thing and it's planting a seed. And we had to have money to buy the seed to plant the seed. So never be jealous when you see somebody else's harvest. Because you don't know how much seed they planted, what their seed cost them, how much time they've been waiting, how hard they've been working to harvest. But I know how to get you in the cycle. And the very first part is plant the seed and don't pull it up. Now here's the one thing. Here's where people get confused. Now you can be seated and because we're going to give it to one second. Here's the part where people get confused. They think, I'm planting my seed. Mm, I'm giving my 10%. Actually, uh, uh, it is Pastor Appreciation Day. So, uh, Pastor Togo, could you come for one second, please? I just, um, I just, I really like your bracelet. Is there any way I could, um, it's 
there any way I could borrow your bracelet? Because I think it would look really cute with my outfit. Mm, now my fit is fire. Looks so good on me. I look wonderful. I love it. Do you guys agree? Does this look good on me? Mm -hmm, I know. I love it. I'm going to wear this every time I wear this outfit now. Because it is so cute on me. Um, <gasps> I think I just spoke to my heart. Since it is Pastor Appreciation Day. I just. God told me to give you this bracelet. I am so generous. Here you go. <sighs> I am just a good Christian. I really am. This bracelet is the tithe. God gives us 100% of everything. And he says, return the tithe to me. I didn't give Tekoa anything yet. I returned what was hers. So the problem, thank you very much. I appreciate you help you look great. So the problem most people have is when they're tithing, they think they planted their seed. No, we opened up the windows of heaven. We rebuked the devourer, but we did not plant our seed. We do not yet qualify for the 30, 60, 90, 100 fold return now in this time. When Isaac said that, it was a time of famine. So it does not depend on the economy or the circumstances or where your business is. It simply depends on the God that you serve. But it can't be the 10%. It has to be the first dime, the first dollar, the first hundred over the tithe. So I told you, I know how to get you in the cycle. I know how to flip a house. I know how to do real estate. I know how to build out a 100,000 square foot campus. I do not know how to drive well or cook. I'm not going to teach those classes. But this I know. I know how to invest money. Money tracks me down everywhere I go. My son, I taught my kids. My son woke up last night. He's like, Mom, I spoke at this church in Tennessee, and, you know, they didn't pay me real good, and, you know, I had a good heart about it, and I just, like, sewed the rest of it in my heart. He said, I went to sleep last night, and some investments that I made went up $4,000 last night. He hadn't even invested. I think he said he invested 300 some odd dollars and got $4,000 return. God knows how to do it but you got to plant the seed. He would have never got the $4,000 return without the $300 investment. And seed isn't our 10%. It's the first above that. So as we give today, um, I believe there's some envelopes and some envelopes in your seat. I believe they're going to give some ways to give on the screen. I think. I don't know the ways to give, so I hope they're going to give the ways to, to give on the screen. And as you're giving, I believe that there's a testimony that they're going to play. Have an amazing week. Right now we have 
a testimonial from none other than our accelerator, Dr. Letitia Brown James. So stick to the screen, stick with us online, and we'll talk to you later, accelerators. Accelerators, my name is Dr. Letitia Brown James, and I have been an accelerator for two years. I am still excited and basking off of all of the wisdom and the nuggets that we received at the acceleration conference. And through networking and friendships, I received a phone call right around that time of the conference from a good friend of mine and colleague that encouraged me to apply for a grant. I am the founder and owner of Victorious Living Counseling and Consulting, and we provide mental health services to children, adults, couples, and families dealing with a variety of mental health issues. So my friend contacted me because she knows that, and she's also a counselor, and she told me about this grant, a trauma grant for children and families that have experienced trauma coming out of Harvard University. And she said, Letitia, I think you should apply for the grant. And I said, me? My company is so small, like I don't know if they would award such a prestigious grant to Victorious Living because we're so small. And she said, Letitia, apply for the grant. So I did. And on Friday, I received an email from Harvard notifying me that my company is one of the awardees of the grants. And I'm so excited about it and just still in shock and humility that we were awarded this grant. So my friend was telling me that she was on the call when they were listing the grantees and when they got to my company, they stopped and talked about how impressed they, they were with my company and what we have to offer. So we're so excited and we also have a new office space that we're gonna be moving into effective November 1st, which will give us more space and capacity to do what we need to do. God has been granting us so much favor with the owner of that place. So we're just so excited, thank you. Oh, how many of you can see God at work? How many of you ready for God to work like that in your life? Say amen. So go ahead and hold up your phone if you gave electronically. Hold up your envelope if you're giving with an envelope today. And is it okay if I bless it before we go? Never plant your seed without speaking to it. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I speak to the seed. And I say, as you go into the ground, you grow. You get strong roots. I speak not plants but trees fruitful trees, abundant trees that won't last for a season but will last for generations and legacy. I speak abundant harvest come from the north, the south, and the east, and the west. Not only financially, God, but in the things that money cannot buy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Place, you're gonna find favor there. Yeah. That when you go into your house, 
you're going to find peace there. Come on, y'all. Hey, hey. That when you go to sleep tonight, you're going to have peace and sleep tonight. Come on, that when you leave these doors, you're going to have health because all things are working together for your good. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. I just want to declare absolutely supernatural acceleration and growth over your life. I'm going to say that one more time because I believe there's a body of believers in this room who do not stutter or doubt or hesitate when a word is being spoken. I'm saying that supernatural acceleration is coming your way and you are going to be receiving that and God is going to show his face. He's going to show his work. This week, someone say this week, I'm expecting a miracle. Father, Ephesians 3.20, exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. You are blessed. You're highly favored. Make sure to love on somebody. We're going to be right there in the back. In fact, Pastor Nicole is also in the back wanting to say hello to you. So we'll see you in the back. We love you. God bless you. And we'll see you here next Sunday. 10